It's a great honor and pleasure to be here in Lisbon. Bom dia, tudo bem? So uh, let's start by going back to just two years after I was born. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, all engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. So please raise your hand if you actually saw the launch of Apollo 11 live. Oh, that is awesome. This mission was not only a success, it was also inspiring. Because it showed that when we humans use technology wisely, we can accomplish things that our ancestors could only dream of. So in this optimistic spirit, let's talk about another journey powered by something more powerful than rocket engines where the passengers are not merely three astronauts, but all of humanity. Let's talk about our collective journey into the future with artificial intelligence. My friend and colleague, Jan Tallinn, who many of you know is one of the founders and creators of Skype, he likes to point out that there's a beautiful metaphor between rocketry and all of technology. It's not enough to build your rocket engines powerful. Before you launch it, you also better make sure you know how to steer it and that you know where you want to go with it. So in this spirit, let's talk about those three same things for, for artificial intelligence. How powerful is it getting? And then how are we going to steer it? And where do we want to go with it? If we take a step back, a big step back, we see that during the past 13.8 billion years, our universe has transformed from being dead and boring to becoming progressively more complex and even coming alive with life forms that, like ourselves, who have consciousness and curiosity and passion for life. Now, this picture I find both humbling and inspiring. It's humbling because we notice that on the larger scale of the cosmos, Life is still an almost imperceptibly small perturbation on an otherwise dead and seemingly lifeless universe. But it's inspiring also in the, because we realize now, thanks to technology that we're building, that it doesn't always have to remain this way. Science has gradually helped us understand ever more about how our universe works, and we can use this understanding to build technology, thanks to which life has the potential now to flourish not just for the next election cycle, but for billions of years, not just on Earth, but throughout our beautiful cosmos. The very first life on Earth I call Life 1.0, because it was really dumb stuff like bacteria that couldn't learn anything during its lifetime. I call us humans 2.0, because we can learn, which in nerdy geek speak would be described as uploading new software into our minds. I was born a native Swedish speaker. I realized that's not going to be very helpful in the rest of the world, so I uploaded a module of software that lets me speak English, for example. And it's this ability to learn which has enabled us humans to be the most powerful life form on our planet. Life 3.0, that can design also its hardware, of course doesn't exist yet, but we're kind of maybe heading in that direction. Maybe we should call ourselves Life 2.1 now, because we can get artificial kneecaps pacemakers and cochlear implants. So let's talk about the growing power of artificial intelligence. What is intelligence, first of all? I define it simply as the ability to accomplish complex goals. And the reason I give such a broad definition is because I really dislike this carbon chauvinism, this idea that you can only be smart if you're made of carbon atoms. This broad definition encompasses not only all biological intelligence, but also all artificial intelligence. Now, the very first time that we humans were dethroned on the chessboard by IBM's Deep Blue, the intelligence there was largely programmed in by humans. 
and the machine beat Garry Kasparov just because it could think faster and remember more. When we were dethroned on the Go board more recently by AlphaGo from Google DeepMind, the intelligence was largely learned through machine learning, deep reinforcement learning. And just the other week, in fact, AlphaGo Zero did away with 3,000 years of human Go wisdom, millions of games, books, poems about Go, and so on, and just learned everything from scratch in just three days by playing against itself and even beat the old Go software 100 to nil. To get a flavor for this, let's look at how another Google DeepMind software, very simple deep reinforcement learning algorithm, learns to play this Atari game. Raise your hand if you've ever played this. Yeah, so you can see it sucks in the beginning because it has no idea what a ball is or what a paddle is or what a game is or anything is, really. It, but it quickly learns simply by being fed the numbers that represent the colors of all the pixels and trying whatever it can do to get a better score. And by now, it's already better than me. It almost never misses the ball. But the funniest thing of all is that when this thing keeps training, it eventually learns something which even the, fo the guys at DeepMind who made this didn't know. Namely, that there's this nice little strategy that if you keep aiming the ball up at one of the corners over and over again, then something wonderful happens. And as soon as it's discovered this trick, you see it just shamelessly exploits this over and over and over again. Now, if you gave your iPad to a four-year-old and then you came back a, few, a little bit later and it was playing like this, you would probably think, hey, this is a smart kid. You know, she's going to go far in life. So here we see how pretty intelligent behavior actually can be learned from scratch. Now, but the Go board is much simpler, of course, and, the, and this board than the real world. So how far can AI go? This is what happened when, a, when Google DeepMind tried to teach robots to walk, again from scratch. And again, what's remarkable here is this deep learning software had no idea what walking was. It just sent random commands saying what angles a joint should be bent in, and this is what happened? It worked for all sorts of different body types as well. So this begs the obvious question, you know, how far can artificial intelligence ultimately go? I like to think about this question in terms of this landscape of all possible tasks that you might have. And that where the elevation represents how difficult the task is, and the sea level represents how good machines are at doing it today. So we clearly have a kind of global warming going on in task space here because the sea levels are rising. This obviously means that you should not rec advise your near and dear to go into careers working on things right at the waterfront, because those are going to be the first jobs to be automated away. But the more interesting question is, what, how high is the sea level going to rise eventually? Some, some top AI researchers think that for one reason or another, machines will never get as good at humans at all tasks. But they're actually in a minority, according to recent polls, where, the, where most researchers who are working on artificial general intelligence think that this is going to succeed, and machines will be able to do everything we can, submerging all land. The median guess in recent polls from AI researchers is about a few decades, maybe decades from now, 50 years, 40 years, 30 years, which makes it very interesting to turn from talking about the power of AI to talking about control. How can we steer this technology? to make sure that this becomes the best thing ever for humanity, not the worst thing ever. To help with this, my colleagues and I founded the Future of Life Institute, a nonprofit which, as you can see, has the word steer right here in its mission statement. And we're very optimistic that we can create an inspiring future with artificial intelligence. If we win the race between the growing power of the technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage the technology, but that's a real challenge, which requires a change of strategy. In the past, we've always stayed ahead in this wisdom race by using the strategy of learning from mistakes. We invented fire, screwed up a bunch of times, invented the fire extinguisher, fine. Invented the automobile, screwed up a bunch of times, invented the seat belt, the airbag, and the traffic light, more or less fine. But with more powerful technology like nuclear weapons and, in particular, superhuman artificial intelligence, we don't want to learn from mistakes. 
That's a ridiculous strategy. We want to get things right the first time, because that's probably the only time we're going to have. Now, some people tell me, Max, stop. Don't talk like that. Shh. That's just Luddite scaremongering. I say to them, no, it's not scaremongering. It's safety engineering. When NASA launched the Apollo 11 mission that we opened with looking at, they thought through very carefully everything that could possibly go wrong when you put three astronauts on top of a 100-meter tall rocket loaded with highly flammable fuel and launched them into a place where nobody could help them. And guess what? There was a lot of stuff that could go wrong. Was that scaremongering? No, that was the safety engineering procedure that led to the success of the mission. So it's in this optimistic spirit that we should look at AI risk to make sure that everything goes right. To help with this, we organized conferences, bringing together leading artificial intelligence researchers and other thinkers from around the world to talk not about how to make the AI more powerful, but how to make it more beneficial. And in my remaining minutes, I just want to highlight four takeaway points that I, f I feel have come out of this. You can read more about the 23 Asilomar AI principles on our website which, as you can see, have been signed by over 1,000 AI researchers from around the world. And, and these are not some sort of clueless, pacifist tree huggers who don't understand what a computer is. Right? We have Demis Asabis here, the CEO of Google DeepMind, behind these movies I show, Jan LeCun from Facebook. We have top AI researchers from IBM, Apple, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what are these things? that I want to share with you, that there is very strong consensus around. Number one, ban lethal autonomous weapons. So just down the road in uh, Geneva, or just up the road, next month, the United Nations is going to discuss whether to ha have an international treaty banning lethal autonomous weapons. We're not talking here about very cybersecurity problems like we heard about from Jared in the previous talk. We're not talking about remote-controlled drones. We're talking about machines, tiny flying drones, for example, which completely automatically decide who to kill and then kill that person with no human input in the loop. Okay? Why is there such consensus around this? Well, very simple. All science can be used for new ways of helping people or new ways of harming people. And I'd like you to raise your hand if you are working with something that's somehow related either to to computer science or biology or chemistry for civilian uses. That's a lot of hands. Raise your hand now if you're working with bioweapons or chemical weapons or any sort of military stuff. I don't see any hands at all here. That's great. And the reason for, for this being this way, actually, is not that it had to be that way automatically. There were a lot of people who wanted to really go gangbusters on bioweapons, for example. But the reason it's ended up this way is because the biologists and the chemists of the world pushed really hard to get international treaties banning the bioweapons and chemical weapons, creating huge stigma. And what, the, what, we, what I hope is that, when, that things are going to stay this way. And 10 years from now, we're going to think of AI as a source of new solutions, not just as a source of a, non, a very ch new technology for murdering people anonymously at very low cost. A second principle there was broad agreement around is that we want to use this amazing wealth being created by artificial intelligence, especially in the future, to make sure everybody gets better off. It's clearly possible if the total economic pie grows to share it around in such a way that the future for most people becomes more like this than like that. If we fail to do that, there's going to be ever more inequality, ever more angry people which has already given us Donald Trump and Brexit and so on. And this is a real opportunity to start thinking harder about the economic sides of this. Third, let's invest more in AI safety research. Raise your hand if your computer ever crashed on you. <laughs> that was annoying, maybe, but <clears throat> it's beyond annoying if it's your self-driving car in the future, your self-flying airplane, the AI controlling your power grid, your nuclear reactor, or, or some nuclear weapon system, right? So we have to really get our act together and focus hard on research into how to turn today's buggy and hackable computers into robust AI systems that we can really trust. 
There are also some longer term challenges if AI continues to progress towards human level and beyond to do with safety research. So let me summarize this with this very short video. Will artificial intelligence ever replace humans? Is a hotly debated question these days. Some people claim computers will eventually gain super intelligence, be able to outperform humans on any task, and destroy humanity. Other people say, don't worry, AI will just be another tool we can use and control, like our current computers. So we've got physicist and AI researcher Max Tegmark back again to share with us the collective takeaways from the recent Asilomar conference on the future of AI that he helped organize. And he's going to help separate AI myths from AI facts. Hello. First off, Max, Machines, including computers, have long been better than us at many tasks, like arithmetic or weaving, but those are often repetitive and mechanical operations. So why shouldn't I believe that there are some things that are simply impossible for machines to do as well as people? Say, making minute physics videos or consoling a friend. Well, we've traditionally thought of intelligence as something mysterious that can only exist in biological organisms, especially humans. But from the perspective of modern physical science, intelligence is simply a particular kind of information processing and reacting, performed by a particular range of of elementary particles moving around, and there's no law of physics that says it's impossible to do that kind of information processing better than humans already do. It's not a stretch to say that earthworms process information better than rocks, and humans better than earthworms, and in many areas, machines are already better than humans. This suggests that we've likely only seen the tip of the intelligence iceberg, and that we're on track to unlock the full intelligence that's latent in nature and use it to help humanity flourish, or flounder. So how do we keep ourselves on the right side of the flourish or flounder balance? What, if anything, should we really be concerned about with super intelligent AI? Here is what has many top AI researchers concerned. Not machines or computers turning evil, but something more subtle. Super intelligence that simply doesn't share our goals. If a heat-seeking missile is homing in on you, you probably wouldn't think, no need to worry, it's not evil, it's just following its programming. No, what matters to you is what the heat-seeking missile does and how well it does it. Not what it's feeling or whether it has feelings at all. The real worry isn't malevolence, but competence. Super intelligent AI is by definition very good at attaining its goals, so the most important thing for us to do is to ensure that its goals are aligned with ours. As an analogy, humans are more intelligent and competent than ants, and if we want to build a hydroelectric dam where there happens to be an ant hill, there may be no malevolence involved, but well, too bad for the ants. Cats and dogs, on the other hand, have done a great job of aligning their goals with the goals of humans. I mean, even though I'm a physicist, I, I can't help think kittens are the cutest particle arrangements in our universe. If we build super intelligence, we'd be better off in the position of cats and dogs than ants. Or better yet, we'll figure out how to ensure that AI adopts our goals rather than the other way around. And when exactly is super intelligence going to arrive? When do we need to start panicking? First of all, Henry, super intelligence doesn't have to be something negative. In fact, if we get it right, AI might become the best thing ever to happen to humanity. Everything I love about civilization is the product of intelligence. So if AI amplifies our collective intelligence enough to solve today's and tomorrow's greatest problems, humanity might flourish like never before. Second, most AI researchers think super intelligence is at least decades away, but the research needed to ensure that it remains beneficial to humanity rather than harmful might also take decades. So we need to start right away. For example, we'll need to figure out how to ensure machines learn the collective goals of humanity, adopt these goals for themselves, and retain the goals as they get ever smarter. And what about when our goals disagree? Should we vote on what the machine's goals should be? Should we do whatever the president wants? Whatever the creator of the superintelligence wants? Let the AI decide? In a very real way, the question of how to live with superintelligence is a question of what sort of future we want to create for humanity, which obviously shouldn't just be left to AI researchers, as caring and, and socially skilled as we are. Thanks, Max. So uh, how do... So this leads to the very last point here. We have to start thinking about what kind of future we want to create. And the sad part is that whenever we go to the movies these days and watch depictions of the future, whether it be Blade Runner or something else, it just makes us envision dystopian futures, all sorts of horrible ways in which the future can go wrong, which will make, have no other effect than making, turning us into paranoid hypochondriacs, right? So I want to end imploring you all to think about what kind of future would you really like to see, not just tomorrow, but a few decades from now with awesome technology. Because if we can articulate a really positive vision for where we want to steer this wonderful technology, then we are much more likely to get it. Thank you. <laughs>